All right, so the story of Boxed. Here we go. Um, and so this is still a pretty new deck for us. So, um, and the marketing team kind of did their thing to it. So I'm gonna try to, uh, to pretend I know what's on these slides. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there's some plug about marketing platforms in here uh, as well. But uh, I got some practice um, yesterday. I, I did a, a different ad week uh, event and um, and I, it was one of my first times ever doing ad week. And so I had no idea what to expect. It was just a bunch of marketers. I heard they drink a lot at conferences. And like, I felt like I was going to go out there and just talk about row ads and just get everyone excited and say, like, when I say row, you say as, row, as. And uh, <laughs> shit didn't work. And so, um, so now it's, uh, it's, it'll be better today. So in the beginning, we started in a two-car garage uh, in Edison, New Jersey, not far from here, across the river. Um, and when I tell that story these days, most folks, friends, families, startup folks are like, that's so awesome, man. That is, man, I want to start a company in my garage. That's how like Microsoft got started. That's how Google got started. You know, Facebook had that early house that they rented. Uh, that's what I want to do. I'm like, dude, you know, I was 30 some years old and this was the garage, all right? So like, it's easy to say that now, but when I was 30 something telling friends and family, when I told my in-laws like, this is what I'm doing, they're like, you're unemployed. That's what that is, you know? And so uh, when you look at this, this was it. This was the garage, man. Like this was a leaf blower, like a shovel, like a, like, you know, UPS charges like $3,000 for that computer from the 90s. Like, I don't even know they made like keyboards with the keys that high anymore. And it's like, you had, like it physically taxed your knuckles when you did it. Um, that was it. And that first two months, like, we had multiple days where no one ordered anything from us. And those were pretty tough times because I remember people had quit their jobs where they were making 100 k a year, sat on that little orange kind of bench thing right there. Um, and it was really humbling. And especially when we didn't have any orders, they would call me and say, hey, uh, 300 million Americans figure everyone wipes their butt. We sell toilet paper. We didn't make a single sale today. You sure this is the right idea? Uh, and I was like, dude, just shut the hell up. Get back to work. And he's like, there is no work. That's the point. And I was like, shit, you know? And so those were tough times. But we stuck through it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the team got larger. Uh, you know, we started setting up rows in the fulfillment center. There was sriracha sauce being sold. Uh, S.E. Johnson stuff at the bottom of the desk or, or packing table. Um, uh, um, we, uh, we, we went with packing peanuts, which was like the stupidest thing ever. No one likes packing peanuts. Um, and so we had one engineer that uh, criticized our decision about packing peanuts. And we had this huge dispenser. And for about a year and a half, every time he ordered, he would get packing peanuts. And so we had to use it somehow, and he hated it. Um, but uh, moving forward, like things started getting... Uh, yeah, it's if you everyone tilt their heads, you know those are uh, those are Uline pallets where uh, Uline started and some some distributors started dropping these like industrial sized pallets on my random driveway in in suburban New Jersey. Um, and I maintain this is when the neighbors started freaking out because there was no parking up and down the street. Um, there were random people in my house. I remember waking up and like making breakfast and seeing people I didn't know in my house, and I was like, this is getting really freaky. I know we were recruiting a younger and younger uh, uh, employee because there were like monster drinks and shit in the, in the uh, refrigerator. And I was like, whoa, this is getting really wild. By this time, the baby department was in the basement. The, um, the chip department was in the living room. High value stuff was literally in my bedroom. Um, so if you go in my bedroom, you better make sure <laughs> you're there for something like you know, high value or else you gotta get the hell out of my bedroom. And so. Um, this was full on crazy. If you stalk me, um, you can, if you found my home home address uh, on Google Maps, uh, Street View, you'd actually see a, like a 40 foot pod container where all the P&G stuff and the Charmin and the, uh, the Bounty used to go. Um, so this was full on, man. Like, I, and I maintain like my neighbors got really nervous. They wanted to call the cops. They thought we were selling drugs. They thought we were like making an e-commerce company. And I was joking yesterday that I, we tried both, but only one worked out. Um, and uh, you guys all laugh, but e-commerce is tough, so I didn't say that's the one that won. Uh, so <laughs> kidding, um, kidding. If Deloitte is in the audience, I promise. Uh, uh, 
clean audit this year. Uh, so uh, this was it. And you think about this, this was every last order that we sold. So of that first quarter in 2014 when we first started as a business. And so um, when you think about this, uh, we were solving a real problem. Like we wanted to go after a problem we ourselves had. So we grew up in the burbs but uh, didn't have access to a warehouse club or warehouse savings when we moved into Manhattan. And so how many, other million, how many millions of other Americans had that similar problem? Well, we went in and tried to give it a shot. So what you're seeing, every blue dot was an order that first quarter in 2014. Every red dot was a warehouse club uh, throughout America. Warehouse clubs like BJ's, Costco, Sam's Club, they're ubiquitous in name and brand, but not ubiquitous in location. So, we were high-fiving each other at the end of that first full quarter. So um, uh, Northeast Corridor, LA, County, San Francisco, Miami, Chicago. Um, these are all folks that uh, ostensibly didn't have the physical means like a car to get to a warehouse club. Uh, so we were high-fiving each other. Uh, Q2 came around. We started spreading across the Midwest. Q3 came around uh, and we basically tracked the dispersion of the US population. Um, this was when I was like, I love all you, but you gotta get the hell out of my garage because this is not working out right now. Uh, and so that's when you saw the pallets started being landed uh, in the middle of suburban um, New Jersey. And so what did we find? Well, we found that yes, some of what we thought we started with was right. Folks didn't have the physical means to access a warehouse club, but at the same time, we were at the right time, at the right place, in a change of the value equation. So what do I mean by that? You ask my mom these days, she's like, um, you know, what does, what does value mean to you, mom? She's like, price. And I'm like, okay. Um, but then you ask anyone here in this audience or anyone on the streets or even out in rural America, you ask any millennial mom, what does value mean to you? A lot will say price, of course, because no one wants to get ripped off, right? Uh, but they'll also say convenience. Uh, and they'll also say a little bit about brand as well. Uh, and so when you think about it, um, the proof is in the pudding, right? Like Uber versus Lyft these days. Like both services are great. Um, millions of Americans are moving over to Lyft, um, not because Uber is, you know, or Lyft is cheaper or Lyft is more convenient. There's less liquidity in their system. There are less cars. But millions of Americans are moving over solely because everything else is starting to become a little bit equal um, and that they just like the brand better. It's not to say that they're doing anything else uh, better. I, I don't know. I'm not too involved in those companies. Um, but from what I hear and from what I see anecdotally, uh, it's solely because of the, uh, the brand. Um, and so for us, um, we're taking that. Um, building a pretty interesting brand uh, and going after this audience. So 200 billion uh, of, of spend by just, uh, or 200 billion of top line by just three uh, warehouse clubs in the US. So uh, Costco, BJ's and Sam's Club, 2% of it is online and 0% of it is mobile. And I'm not up here full, so full of hubris uh, saying that, you know, oh, that's ours, all that spend's gonna be ours. But it creates a jump ball where now we're in this huge race. Our technology folks like us going to figure out retail faster than the retailers figure out technology. And at the end of the day, that's a jump ball, and that's the two sides of the mountain that we're running up. Um, there's room for niche players. Uh, Sam's Club shares the same uh, parking lot as Walmart in 60% of their locations across the country. Sam Walton wasn't dumb. Doug McMillan's a really smart guy. Why don't they just make a super center and say, hey, Sam's Club is rows you know, double Z through double A. Um, they don't because when you parked a car uh, and you self-select whether you go into one or the other, uh, you're there for different reasons and you're showing that. The folks that are going to the Sam's Clubs, um, you know, they are there to stock up. They're there because they have a large family. They're there for an event or they're there because they're powering their business or powering their office pantry. And they're not going to do that by walking into the Walmarts of the world, um, the everything stores of the offline world. So. Um, if I took the SATs again, I probably wouldn't do better, but I would do better here uh, because Walmart is the Sam's Club as Amazon is the boxed online. So we're not the everything store, 1,600 items only. A lot you can't find through Amazon 1P uh, because of channel conflicts. And so we're that unsexy business that goes after wholesale. Like if you want a pallet of pork rinds and Cheetos, like, like we're for you. Uh, like, you know, <laughs> I, it's like if you like, if you want like the hottest fashion brand, like we don't have that, you know, and, and we're okay not having that. And so that's basically, uh, that's basically our business. Um, and so it's really interesting because uh, this is the reason why I have this like plastic cup because 
I've actually gotten jabbed by different brands. It's like, oh, we saw you at this on stage and you were drinking this or eating this or, or that. And then so I know when different brands are coming to the office when like we hide the other brand stuff. And so, um, so or, or like sometimes like we'll only display their brands in the middle of the conference room table. And so like I know like when Coke is in town because like I like look through our snack like stuff and the snack basket. I'm like, where the fuck are the Cheetos, man? Like, you know, what happened to those? And then they're like, oh, and I, sure enough, you know, I, know, I see who, who, uh, who shows up. Um, but uh, so much money is spent in the offline world that, uh, uh, you know, even though Walmart crushed all of offline retail, Target, Dollar General, Publix, they're still pretty big large cap uh, companies. Um, uh, but Amazon, you know, crushed all of online retail per se. But so much money is now spent at Wayfair, Wish, Us, Instacart, we're all building billion dollar companies uh, in the shadow of Amazon. Um, and so uh, it's what we do. I'm gonna skip through a lot of this stuff, 1,600 items, good, better, best. When we pick an item, we move a ton of it, oftentimes more so than, than Amazon does on that single UPC. Um, because again, we're not gonna have 20 different kinds of popcorn through 3,000 3, different sellers. We got like two if you want pre-pop popcorn. And so um, we take the friction out of the system, no membership fees, free shipping, We've done a lot about um, uh, uh, fulfillment centers. So we operate all our own for fulfillment centers, four across the US now. Allows us to cover 99% of America, 94% in two days or less, 50.8% uh, in uh, uh, or overnight, some in as little as three hours, uh, all without a, a membership. So prime-like experience. Uh, without uh, uh, membership fees. And so our biggest one is our fully automated one. It's right out by, um, by uh, Newark Airport. So uh, who's from Jersey here? Who, who's brave enough to admit? Yeah, that, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Uh, so we're 78 meets uh, Garden State Parkway. There used to be a gigantic dairy plant. Uh, there's a big building now uh, that's our fulfillment center. And so it's uh, uh, one of the most advanced CPG fulfillment centers in the world now. Uh, we didn't really film the robotics, but um, this was the day before it actually launched. So basically, it's just replicating what you would do um, uh, in your typical Costco, Sam's Club, or, or, uh, or BJ's. And so, um, sorry, did I go back? What happened? Oh, man. Um, you're going to see it again. Uh, so... Um, you know, most fulfillment centers uh, or most shoppers online, you basically just grab a single item uh, and then you check out, right? Who, who goes to Amazon and says, hey, let me shop the homepage. Let me see what kind of things I can find on Amazon today, hon. You know, like no one, right? No one does that. Uh, but for us, the, major, the vast majority of customers don't use the, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the search bar to shop. And so we're able to build a huge basket. So nine, nine items on average and about $100 average shop. If you think about it, you can amortize the shipping price of, of each of those items over those nine items instead of shipping each to individual customers. Um, we started building uh, different interesting things, including uh, our, our, our latest ad platform. So we found this really weird phenomenon where folks who, who sell like peanuts would, you know, would buy millions of dollars of Facebook ads or different ads. And um, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was in my boxer shorts like a few weekends ago, doing something really glamorous, checking email, uh, checking Facebook, watching Alf reruns. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, this is the low point in my life. Um, and so uh, I was like, oh, awesome, like peanuts, you know, like let's see what, let, you know, we'll charge on CPC. So I'll click, I'll click the peanut ad on Facebook and then it took me to a, a web page all about peanuts. I was like, damn, man, I'm in my box of shorts. Like, I'm watching Alfre runs. Like, I want peanuts. I want to buy peanuts. I don't want to read about peanuts, you know, obviously. Like, and so there's all these brands spending hundreds of millions of dollars and not closing the loop. And it's inexcusable when it comes to online. Offline, yes, it's so, so hard to close a loop, right? Because then, you know, you, gotta, you get a mailer. I've got to put my pants on. I've got to put the DVR on. And then I go, go to the store. But it's inexcusable when you're online, when you just press, like, Control-T, and then, like, you get a new tab. And so... We're doing something interesting where brands come in, and because people don't use a search bar, placement is really important. So it's self-service. Uh, they come in, uh, spend the money that they want, and we show the ROAS of their marketing spend, and they boost things up, or they, boost, or, or they can let other folks um, eat their lunch. Uh, so if they don't spend. Uh, but um, sorry, um, didn't say that. Uh, but if you're a brand in the audience, there's pretty good ROAS. So when I say ro, you say as. Uh, here we go. So. Um, we're like flipping all over the place now. I literally have no idea what's going on. Um, is that my cue to get off stage? Uh, I literally, <laughs> wait, is it? <laughs> no, I, I, like no more slides. I'm, 
Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. We're going back. We're going back. Oh, we're going back in time. All right. So this is um, where I want to sum up, and I promise you these are the last slides, and we're in the home stretch. So uh, we are very different. You could tell um, 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 we're a different type of company. And so um, uh, some of you guys have heard this story before, uh, especially the folks who've worked here. Um, uh, some of the folks have, have not. So uh, Tim is representative of, uh, of a lot of folks in our company. And so um, his title is box loader. Um, if he had a card, it would be box loader. Uh, and so you guys all know, you guys all are part of the startup world, right? Like you often come up with titles that you're just like, what, you know? <laughs> so I met like chief, <laughs> yeah, um, chief cliffhanger, problem solver, and culture like, Guru, you know, and just like, what the hell do you do all day? And you're like, that's what I do. And you're like, no, it doesn't say what the hell you do all day. But Tim's role is box loader. So you don't take Tim's card and say, what do you do all day, Tim? You know, he's like, I load boxes, fool. You know, like, this is what I do. Um, so Tim, he would pick up a box, uh, load the truck, go back, pick up a box, load the, load the truck, go back, pick up another box, load the truck, go on break, come back, oh, more boxes. That's what he did, eight to 10 hours a day, five days uh, uh, a week. So um, always on time, eventually was promoted. And when you're promoted, almost all of our ops folks uh, um, were promoted from within. Um, so almost everyone started as a picker or a packer, and then they get uh, promoted into leads uh, and managerial positions. And so uh, we have this great dinner for them. It's oftentimes the first, first time in their lives they're ever celebrated in a corporate environment. Everyone gets dressed up. Uh, we go to a, a, um, a nice restaurant. Uh, uh, in, you know, like, semi-nice restaurant. Like, we go to Chili's sometimes, you know, like, go to Caesar. It's toilet paper, thin margin, folks, so it's nice for us. Um, so uh, we celebrate them, uh, and, you know, there's drinks. Um, when Tim was uh, kind of promoted, it was, uh, you know, HR wasn't as robust then, so it was like, it was like HR light, and so we got away with, with, uh, with a lot more. Uh, but still, HR was there already. Um, our head HR person was there. Uh, Tim had a few drinks, gets up, and says, I want to say something. And I'm like, oh, shit. I'm like, <laughs> rule number one, I'm thinking to myself, never get drunk at the company parties, Tim. Rule number two, never say, hold my drink, watch this, because nothing good ever comes out of anything that happens after you say that. And so he says, you don't know uh, a lot about me. And I'm like, Oh man, this is this is downhill. This is the most short-lived promotion in the history of Boxed. Uh, and so he goes on to talk, talk to us about his story. Um, older gentleman looks great, though. Um, uh, laid off in 2008. College educated. Was a paralegal for about 20 years at one of the largest law firms in New Jersey. Um, couldn't find steady work. Uh, no one really wanted to hire him. Uh, and he was always thinking about, oh my gosh, there's this. There's this, during that time when he was unemployed, always saw this tech boom started to come up in 2009, 2010, 2011, and he felt like he was getting left behind. He's like, man, I wish there were tech companies uh, in central Jersey that I could join. I don't have the skill set, but I do whatever it takes to, to join one. So he saw our Craigslist ad, uh, said, you know what, I can load boxes. So he loaded boxes, uh, and we gave him that chance. And he looked me in the eye and said, um, because you gave me that opportunity, I will never let you down. Um, and I get, like, I get uh, you know, goosebumps when I think about that, because um, for me, it was a growing up moment for me and a growing up moment for the company, where it wasn't just uh, you know, like software engineers, where if you hand deliver, the CEO hand delivers a turkey sandwich when they ordered a, um, a ham sandwich, like they say, F you, I'm going to Google. These are. These are, you know, there's a lot of those folks out there, man. Like, it's like you got to treat them with kid, kid gloves. Server engineers are really good, you know. Um, but there's these folks who are counting on us to make the right decisions uh, so that they can put food on the table or that they can really be a part of something special that they otherwise would not have the chance uh, to be a part of. And so um, it's the genesis of, I, I think, a growing up for me as a leader. Um, and it takes me back to when kind of, um, you know, I, I was, I grew up in a working class family and oftentimes, you know, the thumb was on our neck, the Huang's neck, and now I came to this realization that, shit, man, like, I'm the thumb now. Um, and so we have to do the right thing whenever we can. Um, we don't operate a charity. 
At the same time, though, can we do the right thing when, when it's called upon? Uh, we try our best. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, but we really try our best to treat our folks well. So whether it's automating the fulfillment center, uh, it would have been really easy to say, hey, Mr. Roboto doesn't take a day off. Uh, and so thank you for getting us here. We're no longer going to need your services. That's obviously the wrong thing to do. We now train folks to operate the most advanced, one of the most advanced fulfillment centers in the world uh, so that their earning power, whether at Box or if they leave Box, is way better over the arc of, of their career. Um, so employee benefits, whether it's a part of my uh, portion to uh, my stock in the company to pay for uh, employees kids to go to college or whether it's the story of, of our, our wedding tuition where this gentleman actually um, ended up crying at work because um, um, well we didn't know so I called him and I was like hey you know I, I try to um, call everyone whenever that, that kind of stuff happened so I called him um, and said hey you know like you're like a grown-ass man why are you crying at work um, <laughs> so <laughs> I for the record, I did say that. HR was not online. He appreciated it. Uh, he had a laugh. Um, but I found out, in all seriousness, um, he was saving, uh, or he had almost saved enough money to, uh, to kind of have a wedding with the woman of his dreams. Um, but his mom got sick, and so he was using all of his savings to pay for his mom's medical bills. And he was working seven days a week, overtime, whenever he could get it, two separate jobs. Um, and did the math that day and just realized that he wasn't saving fast enough uh, for his mom to be able to attend his wedding. Um, and it brings me back because um, when you hear that on the phone, what do you really say? You know, like, uh, I'm a human just like you guys. What do you say when another human says that to you? Um, doesn't ask for your help, but just says, hey, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back strong tomorrow. Um, you could do something about it, or you can say, hey, you know, that's, that's the way life works. Um, I've told our board, I've told our investors that 11 times out of 10, uh, given that situation, uh, I'm going to do what's right for the folks powering our shareholder returns. Um, and I'm not perfect, and, and we're not perfect. Uh, but in this situation, I think we did the, uh, the right thing. Um, so other issues, uh, it actually becomes contagious, uh, doing right. Uh, and now it's starting to become the brand of Boxed. And we didn't sit here and whiteboard, what do we stand for? And then let's say, let's make everyone know that's what we stand for, and that's our brand. It's actually, we started off doing the right thing, and eventually it's become our brand. Uh, that includes going after things uh, where we feel like it's just simply not fair. So um, women in the audience will know um, 33, 32 states still tax feminine care products like tampons and pads, uh, like uh, luxury good items. Um, right? It's like literally, it's crazy. It's there's a statutory tax, right? Fellas in the audience, you might not know what I'm talking about, but do the, this, I guarantee you, uh, do this test and you'll be on board. Uh, next time your girlfriend, uh, you know, sister, wife, whoever calls, uh, daughter and says, hey, um, can you pick up some Femcare products on the way home? Um, and you tell them like, hun, times are tough. Um, it's a luxury good item. Now's not right time. <laughs> Uh, you know, let's find some other alternative and promise next month we'll get these things, you know? <laughs> well, you're going to be single really quickly, right? Like, it's not going to, it doesn't pass a straight face test, but yet we tax women all across the country uh, as luxury good items, like in terms of uh, femcare products. So um, we're the only retailer in the country that rebates this uh, back to women if you're unfairly taxed. Um, the manufacturer tax, some razors are 100% more expensive solely because they're pink. Um, and so when you think about that, it's not like women have like, if anything, you need like stronger razors for men, man. I've seen some beards on, on dudes that's just like crazy. Like you probably need like a freaking like lumberjack axe every morning. Um, so I don't buy the fact that no one at Box buys the fact that the woman razor is more engineered than the men's razor. That's why it costs 100% more. It's BS. And so uh, we bring the prices at parity and we re rebate that difference back to um, uh, our, our female shoppers. And so uh, I can't take credit for this. This was all the work of the fine women at Box that banded together and said, we're complicit in this and we need to do something about it. And so uh, when people ask, how do you make an authentic brand? How do you make sure customers know you're authentic? One, it can be authentic. And two, when times are tough like this, when you're going to impact your bottom line, that's when people find out if you're authentic or not. And so for us, um, we did it. Um, so if you come on Box, Rethink Pink is a tagline. Tag Anything with that tagline, uh, you have the difference rebated back to you. Um, these are the women at Box that worked on this initiative. Um, and now some of them 
fly over around the country to testify under oath uh, in front of state legislatures to try to make the other 30 plus states uh, flip over into the 21st century, if you will. Um, including Stanley the dog, who's a female, I've been assured, and I did the check, and Stanley the dog is female. Um, that's Natasha's dog, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's definitely a female. Um, but that said, um, I, I kind of took you along the journey, and I know it was kind of ups and downs all over the place, but welcome to the life of a startup and the life of a founder of a startup that's going through ups and downs, uh, just like everyone else's life. And so um, throughout that time, uh, we didn't whiteboard what our brand uh, was. Uh, what we did and how we did it and what we stood for became our brand. And thank you for the opportunity to share that journey and to share that brand with you today. Thanks, guys. Yeah.